John Parshall was on our program for the 65th anniversary. Yeah, something like that. He, he wrote a book, Shattered Sword. And again, if any of you, did you bring some copies? He has no copies. But again, you can order a copy from Axel. He's got the little sheet on it. Uh, you know, most military history books, if they sell three to 5,000, they're a real success. 50,000 copies. That's how acclaimed his book is. And John, I can't tell you how uh, thrilled I am that you uh, accepted a short notice replacement. Uh, it's a different topic, but uh, John is a wonderful speaker, and I'm forever indebted for you to jump into the flames here with this wonderful audience we've got. John, welcome to the round table again. The things I want to accomplish tonight, I want to talk a little bit about the genesis of the kamikazes. Where did they come from? Um, and then I want to talk about the early operations in the Philippines. I want to then look at Okinawa. I want to talk a little bit about how kamikazes might have been used in the defense of the Japanese home islands if an invasion of the home islands had ever come forward and then look at an evaluation of their effectiveness. How useful were they? Did they change the course of the war? Um, and then wrap that up uh, finally with some sort of contrasting imagery in terms of how the Americans perceived the kamikazes and how the Japanese today perceive the kamikazes. So without further ado, you know, we as Americans in the last 15 or 20 years have become much more familiar uh, with suicide weapons than we would care to be, obviously. But if we sort of wind the clock back and put ourselves in the context of 1944, 1945, there was a sense at that time um, that suicide weapons represented something wholly unprecedented. This, this is nothing that we had ever encountered before. And it was really a shocking development for our soldiers and our, uh, the people on the home front to really face up to. And there was a, a tendency at that time, I think, to view it as being something that was sort of crazy. You know, how, how could this happen? This is just nuts. And yet I would argue, and I think the Japanese would even argue at the time, that actually uh, the kamikazes were a sort of a logical outcome between two primary forces that were work in the final stages of this conflict, namely Japanese culture and the threat environment that their troops and aviators were having to operate in. And so those are the things I want to talk about first, uh, the first being culture. Of course, the, the samurai warrior caste had had a very large effect on Japanese society for the better part of 500 years. And even though uh, the samurai had been formally disbanded as part of the Meiji Restoration, nevertheless, a lot of their warrior ethos and their mindset carried forward into modern Japan's military as well. So every Japanese schoolboy would have known the story of a guy like Kusunoki Masashige, who was uh, famous for having worked for a, a very dumb emperor who, when confronted with uh, a much superior enemy army, Kusunoki came to his emperor and said, I've got a battle plan here. We're going to lure these guys up into a mountain. We're going to ambush them, and that's how we're going to you know, deal with their superior numbers, only to be told by the emperor that, no, actually, I would much prefer if you would offer these guys open battle out in the middle of a field someplace. And Kusunoki sort of gulped and saluted and said, yes, sir, and went off uh, riding to that battle, knowing full well that this meant almost certain death. And indeed, that's exactly what transpired. He died, his brother died, and his army was annihilated. But the Japanese look at him and they say, well, he is uh, the perfect embodiment of the virtues that we look for in a samurai warrior. He was loyal to the death. He did not question his orders. He, he obeyed his, his superior. And so he was very much respected uh, for, the, for the part that he played in history. So if we fast forward then to the Meiji Emperor, who is really the, the, the father of modern Japan. 
Meiji is rebuilding his country's military along more western lines, and so he's adopting the German army as the, uh, the technological model for his army, and the, the British Navy, of course, is, as his, as his uh, naval example. And yet he's bringing forward a lot of the mental models from the preceding uh, uh, samurai era. So if we look at some of the quotes that come out of the imperial rescript, that are issued to his soldiers and sailors in 1882, one of the quotes that I find very striking is, you know, our relations with you, our soldiers, will be most perfect when, uh, when you look up to us as being your head and we look down upon you as our limbs, okay? I don't need you to be thinking. I need you to be following your orders. And notice, too, the very personal relationship that this establishes between the sovereign and the soldier. I am literally giving you your rifle or your plane or whatever. You are a part of me. And I am, you know, I am the godhead here, if you will. And, and so you, you can understand why failing the emperor would be taken very personally and would be you know, an absolutely shameful thing to do, which is why you see the, the quotation later on uh, talking about, you know, famously, duty is weightier than a mountain while death is lighter than a feather. So if we fast forward then to Emperor Hirohito, who is Meiji's grandson and steps onto the throne in the mid-1920s, this is the sort of ethos that he has inherited from his grandfather as far as the kind of military that they've got. And so the Japanese state wastes no time in beginning to turn out a new generation of, of soldiers. And of course, they start with their school children. This becomes a, a part of their primary education. So here is a shot of Japanese schoolboys. I believe this is 18, 1896 being taken. They're lined up with rifles and so forth. So all Japanese school children. Uh, were taught to revere the emperor as a living god. This was built in the curriculum. Um, all of their school books emphasized Japanese superiority, and they extolled the virtues of, of war as being an important priority in, in you know, promulgating the Japanese state. And these tendencies became even more pronounced during the Great Depression, of course, when Japan was leaning even further to the right and, and turning to sort of an ultra-nationalist agenda. About the same time in the Great Depression, uh, we then began having actual paramilitary training introduced into the school curriculum. So all Japanese boys were receiving about 100 hours of training. And this was fairly basic stuff. You know, it's marching, riflery, going out in the countryside and doing marches and so forth. But nevertheless, you're starting to build into them the basic ethos that all of you are potential soldiers for the emperor. And they're turning about a million of these kids out a year. And again, war is presented to them as not something to be avoided, but rather as, as a glorious act, uh, an act of fulfillment for the state. So here we have a picture of uh, Japanese schoolboys out in the field on their bicycles with rifles. I found this quote just absolutely stunning. Uh, this is the, the principal of a school. I, I forget which, which town it came from, but notice that this educator, this Japanese educator's proudest achievement is to say that I am turning out soldiers for the emperor who are not going to be uh, scared at all to lay down their lives, that they should be ready to lay down their lives at the drop of a hat. Entering this school is the same thing as joining the army. That's a really pretty stunning statement when you, when you think about it. And it leads naturally enough to pictures like this. You know, we've got school kids drilling in the, in the schoolyard with spears. And that leads naturally enough to these guys. Um, and I just, this picture is just wonderful because here we have a group of Japanese aviators who are in the you know, late, uh, late portions of the war. They're standing in front of a modern combat aircraft and yet you'll notice that all of them have samurai swords, which is a fairly anachronistic way to go into aerial combat. But nevertheless, that's, these are the guys that we are facing in the late portion of the war. They are modern warriors, but they very much have that samurai mindset. Unfortunately for these gentlemen, they are operating in a threat environment which is absolutely inimical uh, to their being able to carry out their mission. So if we take a look at what they're up against starting in late 1944, the primary carrier task force for the U.S. Navy at this time, Task Force 3858, depending on who's driving it, 
comprises about 120 vessels. They can bring anywhere between 12 to 1,500 aircraft to the party, the majority of which are going to be fighters and which are leaning more towards fighters as the war goes on. They are sporting an absolutely phenomenal array of defensive weaponry. And as the war goes on, that weaponry is becoming increasingly more lethal. So the front line of our defenses, of course, is our, our second generation aircraft like the Hellcat and the Corsair. All of these assets now are being controlled centrally within our aircraft carriers within the Combat Information Center, which has the ability to, in real time, collate all the data that's coming in from radar intercepts and radio intercepts and so forth, so as to be able to vector those fighter assets where they need to go um, and efficiently distribute those assets to defeat incoming threats. So, for instance, if you take a look at your typical um, carrier force during 1942, the combat air patrol is you know, ranging out to 25, 30 miles thereabouts. By the time we get to 1944, those planes are going 50, 60, sometimes 75 miles away from the force. So obviously we have a much bigger defensive footprint that you've got to get through in order to get at our carriers. If you manage to make it there, you are then confronted by American warships that are absolutely bristling with defensive armaments, including the 5-inch 38 caliber gun, which is hands down the finest uh, heavy caliber AP um, dual purpose gun of the war. Of course, the 40 millimeter Bofors, which likewise is the finest medium caliber AA gun of the war. The five-inch guns are being directed by the Mark 37 director, which is the finest uh, anti-aircraft director of the war. And by 1944, this, this director is being slaved uh, up to two different fire control radars in order to get uh, very accurate range, in, uh, range data input. So one way that we can think about defensive firepower is throw weight, which is how much explosive and steel can I put up in a minute's worth of time around a formation? And being a spreadsheet junkie as I am, I went out and, and built a model of sort of a hypothetical carrier formation. Um, you know, carrier in the middle, a couple of cruisers, a quartet of destroyers. So if we take a look uh, right around the Battle of Midway, this formation will put up about 32,000 pounds per minute worth of explosive in the air. And by the way, that is already about two or three times as much firepower as a, a comparable Japanese formation can generate. If we fast forward just six months later at the Battle of Santa Cruz, and now suddenly uh, one of the fast battleships shows up, like the South Dakota, oh, and maybe we throw in one of our Atlanta-class uh, anti-aircraft cruisers, suddenly the throw weight of that formation goes up to 74,000 pounds per minute. In other words, it's doubled or more in about six months. And this is just at the beginning of the transformation of the U.S. Navy's defensive capabilities. So then if we take a look at late 1944, all of a sudden the throw weight of these vessels has gone up to this point. Even our destroyers at this point are packing around 11,000 pounds per minute. Uh, the battleships and the carriers are doing 40, 45,000 pounds. Notice that that battleship, that one battleship at this point, is putting more lead in the air than our entire formation was putting in the air uh, around the time of the Battle of Midway. Then if you factor in the effect of the VT fuse, uh, which was introduced in 44 for the five inch guns, which drastically simplifies our fire control problems. If I can just get a shell near that target, this shell will explode on its own and I don't have to worry about fusing it. And depending on whose estimates you read, that ends up increasing the lethality of our five inch gun systems by as much as a factor of seven. So you go back and you do the math on that and here's what the effective throw weight of our formation starts looking like with, with the VT fuse thrown in. 575,000 pounds per minute. That's about an 11,000% increase in two years. And, you know, throw weight is kind of funny money. You know, our, the destructiveness of these systems doesn't actually increase linearly with throw, mate, throw weight. But nevertheless, you get the picture. You can see where things are going here. You know, this is just a fantastically dangerous formation to approach from any angle. So, you know, by late 1944, coming anywhere near one of our carrier formations is tantamount to committing suicide. It, it just is. And this means that 
that the conventional attack tactics that were being used by the Japanese at the beginning of war are now essentially bankrupt. They just do not work anymore. And from a return on investment standpoint, it just doesn't make any sense to train a carrier aviator for a year or more to throw this guy's life away in one or two sorties. It's just, it's senseless. We just can't do this anymore. And the Japanese realize this. So that's the sort of environment that we come to then when we start looking at the, the initial operations in the Philippines. So fall of 1944, the Marianas have been captured by the Americans, um, and the Japanese are really casting about, asking themselves, how are we going to contest this? And the, the scholarship is kind of murky on who came up with this idea first. It seems pretty clear that there were a number of different unit commanders who simultaneously sort of came up with this notion of, well, we've got to start changing our tactics to being what is euphemistically referred to as sure hit, sure death. In other words, I know that if I spend the life of one of my aviators, I should be able to get a, a hit on an enemy vessel. It's really this guy, though, Vice Admiral Onishi Takajiro, who is the commander of First Air Fleet in the Philippines, who has got enough rank and heft to sort of institutionalize this thought. And so it's Onishi who, who comes to the, to the conclusion that these are the tactics that they've got to turn to. During the invasion of the Philippines, uh, the Japanese Navy implements uh, Operation Shogo, which uh, th what they're doing is they're essentially playing their last remaining card. Their carrier force has been whittled down to impotence, but they still have a number of heavy surface combatants out there which can potentially go out and, and contest the beachheads. And so that's what they de determined to do. Uh, they're going to drive the battleships and cruisers in there and try to, try to wipe out our invasion beachhead. And this, of course, leads to the Battle of Leyte Gulf. The problem for Onishi, who is in charge of uh, the, the Philippines' defense, is that he hasn't got enough aircraft to do anything credible. Um, um, he's already been badly beaten up by some of the precursor raids, and he's, he's, he's looking around thinking, what am I going to do? So he comes into the headquarters of the 201st Air Group on 19 October, and he says, boys, I've got a little mission for you. I would like to get uh, volunteers. I need 24 volunteers to do suicide missions. Um, and your goal, and it's a very simple one, is to disable all of the American fleet carriers for about a week. That's all I need, you know, just to get the, the that battleships in there to do their thing. Just put them out of business for a week. Of course, putting the American carrier fleet out of business for a week is, you know, a, a goal beyond the power of any other naval force on the planet at this point in time. And it's certainly not going to be accomplished by 24 guys and zeros. But nevertheless, that's, that's the mission that Onishi outlines, and he very quickly gets his 24 volunteers. And they go out and do their thing starting on the 25th of October, and this is uh, the result of one of those attacks. And this is the, the carrier St. Lo being hit, given her death blow by a kamikaze, probably Lieutenant Seki, who is the leader of this first attack group. And the results of this initial attack are actually very promising. Of course, the Americans are completely surprised by these new tactics, and they end up, uh, the Japanese sink one of our Jeep carriers, and they damage another uh, quartet, which looks like a pretty good exchange rate as far as Onishi is concerned. And so he immediately doubles down and uh, asks for more volunteers, and he gets them. And not only that, but he starts going out to his peers in some of the other air groups, not only in the Navy, but also in the Army, and saying, you guys have got to get with the program and stop doing these conventional attacks. We need to go to special attacks. This is the only way forward. And Onishi's rationale at the time um, is that given the inferiority of our aviators and the fact that they've got bad equipment and poor training, this is the only way to make their lives meaningful. Uh, and I honestly think that it is better for all concerned to continue the suicide operations. And I just. I find this bitterly ironic that, you know, here he is sort of casting himself as the voice of compassion. The, vo the compassionate thing to do here is to make sure that our soldiers and aviators continue killing themselves. You know, you'll, you'll pardon me, but another reaction might be, maybe we should recognize that this war is lost and we ought to call it. Um, but in this respect, Onishi is absolutely emblematic of the sort of hardline attitude that is prevalent in the upper echelons of the Japanese military at that time. So Onishi doubles down and we suddenly get a, a spate of attacks. So if we take a look uh, at the Philippines, uh, the yellow dots down here are the initial series of attacks that occur during uh, the October 
uh, November, December time frame in the Philippines. And they're mostly aimed at contesting the landing beaches down here uh, in Leyte. Of course, Operation Shogo fails, and the, the Battle of Leyte Gulf is, is just an annihilating failure for the Japanese. Uh, most of their remaining heavy service warships are, are wiped out there, and the, the Americans capture, capture Leyte and then move on in the new year to uh, the invasion of Luzon proper. And this ends up then a uh, new spate of operations. You can see down here in the orange here, a real, a real bump up in the number of sorties. And these are all aimed at uh, contesting the American invasion uh, that is going into Lingayen Gulf right there. Taken all together, Philippines uh, results for the kamikazes. They sink a couple of our Jeep carriers. They sink a number of our destroyers. Killer wounded, you know, depends on the numbers you look at, but it's about a 7,000 7, American casualties as a result of that. So that's a fairly good return ratio as far as the, the Japanese are concerned, which takes us then to Okinawa. Um, Okinawa is invaded on the 1st of April of 1945, and the Japanese just absolutely throw everything they can at us to try to defeat those landings. The most famous of the suicide operations is uh, the sacrifice of, of the Japanese battleship Yamato and half of her supporting task force um, that results in the death of about 4,600 Japanese sailors uh, for, I believe, six aircraft on our part, maybe eight. It's not a lot. It's, it's a walkover of horrific proportions. And then in the air, of course, uh, once again, you can see the large number of sorties that happen uh, starting in April of 1945 and going all the way through June, and they are all concentrated down here right around the island of Okinawa itself. A number of interesting things happen, too, from a tactical standpoint. Uh, their tactics begin evol evolving, whereas in the Philippines, you had two basic attack profiles, and these were mostly delivered during the day. You would either make a very high-level approach, do a glide run, and then a final terminal dive uh, into the target to try to pick up as much speed as possible and make that fire control solution really difficult, or you would come in on the deck and then at the very last minute do a pop-up or a wing-over and, and plow into the target. So those, those are the sort of the bread and butter that was developed in the Philippines, but these tactics are now augmented by a whole new array of things. For one thing, whereas in the Philippines we are operating with groups of, you know, a dozen aircraft, maybe, you know, four or five at a time, what happens at Okinawa is uh, massed attacks of sometimes hundreds of aircraft, which are referred to as kikasui, uh, floating chrysanthemum. And these, intriguingly, are coordinated between both the Army and the Navy, which was hard to do because they hated each other. Um, but if you take a look then at the total sorties that are delivered uh, during the initial phases of the attack, you can see um, obviously they really are pulling out the stops here, um, hundreds and hundreds of, of kamikazes. And of course, the numbers start going down as they start running out of airplanes, but you know, they expend a, a pretty phenomenal total of aircraft during the course of the Okinawa campaign as a whole. This is, this is an all-out effort on their part. They end up gunning for uh, a number of our radar pickets. So you see the little circles out here. This is where our radar destroyers were located uh, to give warning to the anchorage and to the carrier fleet that was behind it of incoming attacks. And sure enough, if we take a look at where the attacks actually went down, you can see this big um, sort of bulge here on this northeast threat vector as they're coming in, and of course a lot of them against the anchorage as, uh, as well. They begin using uh, dawn attacks and also night attacks, which was unusual for them, uh, going after our airfields and also going after our ships. They introduced a new weapon, uh, the Oka, which is a rocket-powered glider. It's, it's essentially a manned guided missile, which is strapped onto the belly of a G4M medium bomber, such as this. This is actually the first uh, Oka mission that goes out, they send out six Bettys, and all six of them are shot down before the Okas can actually be delivered. And of course, the Americans are not slow in realizing that, you know, the best way to defeat one of these Oka attacks is to go out and get these planes before they have a chance to launch on you. So uh, this weapon was not terribly successful. It did have some limited success against smaller combatants, but didn't really do anything against our carriers. 
since I was talking down in Texas about special forces, you know, we tend to think of special forces, you know, guys like the Rangers and so forth, as being the creme de la creme. You know, these are the elite of any uh, country's soldiers that get committed to those sorts of units. And yet what ends up happening at Okinawa is even though uh, the special attack units are very special, there's an inversion going on here in that the Japanese are intentionally sacrificing their least capable, least trained aviators um, in these sorts of operations because, frankly, they need to be saving the better trained guys to be doing things like doing recon missions around the fleet and also guiding these special attack aviators into battle because a lot of them couldn't find the, the enemy on their own if they needed to. So they're reserving the more skilled pilots for those roles and they're, frankly, putting the cannon fodder in. In some cases, these, these kids have only been uh, given 30 to 50 hours worth of stick time before they get into a cockpit to fly off to their final sorties. Depending on whose numbers you believe, and there's a lot of different numbers out there, um, Okinawa was obviously very painful for the, the U.S. Navy. They sank uh, 28 different ships, uh, including uh, 10 of the destroyers. A lot of those radar pickets were really badly beaten up uh, as a result of this. Hundreds of ships damaged about 10,000 casualties, but the Japanese uh, sacrificed almost 8,000 aircraft, not just kamikazes, but also conventional planes too. This also includes uh, operational launches, losses, and losses on their airfields that were being bombed and strafed at this point in time as well. So this was a, a very expensive campaign for the Japanese. If we take a look at you know, how effective were kamikazes uh, in the grand scheme of things, there was uh, one study that was done by the Navy actually during the war um, where the Navy estimated that the percentage of kamikazes who would hit a ship would be about 27%, whereas the percentage of uh, effectiveness if you were delivering a conventional uh, attack against those same ships would be a tenth as good, about 2.7%. Even some of the later studies um, that were uh, using post-war data would suggest that uh, they were not quite as effective that, as that, but you're still delivering you know, a 12, 13 uh, percent hit ratio as opposed to the 2.7 uh, percent hit ratio that you were getting with conventional attacks. So yeah, um, a kamikaze attack is certainly has a much higher percentage chance of delivering uh, a result against an American warship. In terms of what the damage from that plane actually does, it turns out that a kamikaze is in fact much more destructive than just dropping a bomb on a ship because you're coming in with the plane, it's loaded with gasoline, it's got the kinetic energy of the airframe uh, hitting as well. And so against American carriers at least, whereas a bomb w might put a carrier uh, in the dock for you know, three, four days and be out of, out of action for a week, a kamikaze hit will put it in the dock for two weeks and it'll be out of action for a month. So again, in terms of, of bang for your buck, uh, the kamikazes were actually more effective. When we look at efficiency though, and so what this, what this graph shows us is black is the number of hits, uh, white is the number of misses, so here's our total number of sorties to attain this result in any given month. And so what you see is, yeah, the black bar is going up, and then when we get to Okinawa, it goes really up. So they're getting a lot of hits. But look at the number of planes total that they're having to expend. Effectiveness, efficiency, hits per plane are actually going down as we get into the Okinawa campaign. And that makes sense because the Americans, of course, are, are no longer surprised by these sorts of tactics and are beginning to develop counter tactics uh, to, to use against them. Our air defenses are frankly becoming more effective. So, you know, no matter how you slice it, yes, TOCO attacks were slightly or moderately, uh, you know, more effective plane for plane than conventional attacks. The efficiency of those attacks, however, was declining. And no matter what you do, and I don't care, you know, how you want to run the math, yes, a moderate increase of, of tactical effectiveness is a nice thing to have, but it does not change a whit the underlying strategic calculus of this war. We have crushing, overwhelming force at this point in the war, and there is absolutely nothing that the Japanese can do at this point to divert that scale of power that's being directed against them. <laughs>
unfortunately for us, that is not how the Japanese see things. Um, they dramatically overestimate the effectiveness of these attacks. And so if we look at you know, the claims that they make in terms of, of ships being sunk, and the actual uh, numbers that are being sunk, you know, there's a, a pretty marked disparity there. And that's nothing new. I mean, aviators have always overclaimed, you know, planes shot down or damaged under the enemy. That's just sort of, that's par for the course. Everybody's aviators do that. The problem for the Japanese is that they, first of all, accepted wildly uh, inflated claims as sort of the norm, and then they actually sort of believed them. There was nobody in the organization doing the debriefs and saying, I don't really buy that. And in fact, we see this phenomenon even in the higher echelons of their command structure. So if we take a look at the, the diary of uh, Admiral Ugaki, who at one time was Admiral Yamamoto's right-hand man in combined fleet. So here we have an example. You know, we didn't actually know the results of our attacks, but judging from the enemy telephone calls, uh, yeah, that must have been four carriers sunk, okay? <laughs> or we've got guys, our recon pilots saw 150 smoke columns, which probably were the smoke columns from their planes being shot down, but we judge that as, you know, having been a successful war result on our port. And of course, you know, understand that even the guys that are flying recon missions, you know, it's, it's damned hard for them to come back alive from these things too, of course, but what you've got here is, is a garbage in, garbage out sort of intelligence cycle where we're just not getting good results. So we've got wildly over optimistic information going in. This leads to, quote, validation of the tactics that we're using, which leads to continued hopeless efforts to continue the war. And this ends up having a really uh, detrimental effect on how do we terminate a war with this opponent. And, you know, I... <laughs> I don't know how many have seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail, but this is the scene that comes to mind. You know, Arthur is going through the woods and he runs into the Black Knight and they have a, a duel and fairly short order, you know, Arthur cuts off both of the Black Knight's arms and the Black Knight won't give up. And Arthur is absolutely incredulous. He ain't a stupid bastard, you've got no arms left. <laughs> yes, yes, I have, it's just a flesh wound, you know, and, and we, we laugh about that. But this really is the mindset that we're dealing with. How do you bring to termination a war with an opponent who either will not or cannot admit to themselves that they are beaten? That's a really tough problem to solve. This brings us to uh, Ketsugo, the final defense of Japan. So the situation now at uh, the midpoint of 1945 Okinawa has been lost. Japan is completely cut off from all of its sources of raw materials and a large portion of its food imports as well. The internal food distribution system is absolutely falling to pieces because our fighters are now ranging all over Japan and are blowing up the trains. It's just, it's a shambles. Um, and yet at the same time, uh, the Japanese know that they are probably going to have to face up to a massive U.S. invasion in fairly short order. And yet the Japanese military uh, leadership remains determined that they're going to fight this thing out to the very bitter end. And their, their hope for this is based on the belief that if they can inflict a heavy enough blow against our initial landings and inflict enough casualties, the American home front will just say, this is not worth it. We should not be sending, you know, a half a million American boys or whatever it's going to be to their deaths in order to win this war. That is, that is their hope. So what ends up happening around this time is that uh, special attack weapons go mainstream, I would say. And now it's not just aircraft anymore. The Japanese are fielding a, a, an array of different weapons of all sorts of different sorts. Torpedoes, uh, suicide speedboats, submarines, frogmen, the whole schmear. So here we have a Shinyo. Uh, this is basically a speedboat with a couple of depth charges or a bomb in the nose that is manually detonated uh, by the, the pilot when he hits the side of, a, of an American vessel. We have the Kaiten, which is uh, basically taking a Type 93 long lance torpedo, taking out the midsection, putting in a, a little fuselage that's barely big enough to fit a pilot and a periscope into it that can then be steered against uh, an American ship. We have uh, midget submarines, the Kairu and Koryu, which are not explicitly um, suicide weapons, but everybody understands what the, the likely outcome of, of driving one of these things anywhere near an American force is going to be, so they might as well be suicide weapons. We have suicide frogmen, 
who uh, are fitted with uh, a breathing apparatus and are given a pole mine, uh, they will walk along the bottom until an American landing craft comes overhead, at which point they ram uh, the mine into the bottom of the ship and detonate it and hopefully blow up the landing craft. And of course, they blow themselves up too in the process. So by the time you know, we get to quarter three in 1945, the Strategic Bombing Survey uh, estimates that there were about 10,000, almost 11,000 Army and Navy aircraft uh, on Japan, half of which are slated for special attack, and about 3,700 of which are, are available for those operations. They built around 4,000 operational suicide boats. Um, out of, well, they've got 4,000 that are operational. They produced 6,000. They've got a number of midget subs and Kaiten in various bases and many play, uh, secreted into little caves and stuff like that all along uh, the coast. And they have 1,200 of these frogmen. Uh, however, they don't have any mines available to them yet. But that situation, well, you know, that's going to change relatively quickly. The sort of the back of the napkin math that the Japanese are using here is that they're, they're shifting their target priorities. We're not going after aircraft carriers anymore. We're going after troop transports. We want to inflict as many casualties as possible. And of course, we know that troop transports are not nearly as well defended uh, as our carriers are. And those troop transports are going to be very close inshore, which means we can you know, come right out of the woodwork practically and jump these things. Um, they presume that they're going to get about a 16% hit ratio, which is a little optimistic, but nevertheless, that should give them 400 hits. Uh, the Shinyo speedboats are going to kick in another 67. Of course, we're operating in the world of sure hit, sure death tactics, and so every hit sinks a ship. Um, but, you know, as you run through this math, basically they think that they can sink about 120 ships and that should account for about a third of uh, the invasion force, which would be a lot of American body bags sent back home. The other fascinating thing that happens uh, around this time, actually as far back as March, is that we erase the line between soldier and civilian within Japan. So they, uh, the Supreme Defense Council promulgates a law that basically says that if you're a man or a woman of any sort of decent age at all, congratulations, you are now part of the self-defense forces. And you are uh, appended as a, a local paramilitary organization, and you are now working directly for whatever uh, combat division or mixed brigade is in your neighborhood. And initially, uh, some of the Japanese unit commanders were thinking to themselves, well, when the, the invasion actually comes in, I'm probably going to have to move these auxiliaries up into the hills and at least get them out of the combat zones. But they very quickly became aware of the fact that given the vast number of civilians that were in the potential landing sites in Kyushu, there was no way to move them up into the hills. There was no way to feed them. So all of these people would have been directly in the path of the American invasion. Um, and they would have been viewed as combatants. So you see then mass training of civilians kicking off. They don't have enough weapons to arm these people uh, in many cases. But what's happened is basically all of Japan's citizens are now, are now so, uh, special attack soldiers, which leads to images such as this, uh, Japanese schoolgirls drilling with rifles, and even more poignantly, uh, Japanese women drilling with spears. So basically what's happened by this point in time is Japan's entire national strategy is centered on an act of grand nihilism and mass suicide. That is the world that we are operating in by late 1945. So the question inevitably becomes, you know, could Ketsugo have succeeded? Would, would they have inflicted enough casualties on the Americans to defeat that initial invasion? And I, this is completely unknowable. I don't have a crystal ball big enough. Um, my friend Rich Frank, who wrote the book Downfall, who I would, you know, uh, accede to as being the, the real master of this subject material, says exactly the same thing. Who knows what ends up happening? My bet is that given our predominance in terms of firepower and so forth, I think we're going to get ashore in Kyushu. But I think it's just going to be absolutely horrific. And certainly the civilian body count was going to be just grotesque. This brings me to the sort of the conclusion of the talk. I immediately after the war, 
there was a tendency on the, on the part of the Japanese civilian population who, not surprisingly, were very sick of the Japanese militarists to view those pilots who had participated in special attack operations as being war criminals as, and also as being crazy. Uh, there was very much an anti-kamikaze viewpoint for a number of years. And yet, intriguingly, sort of in the 1960s and 70s, that imagery started to be reversed. And so you start seeing images within Japan that, that portray a much more heroic uh, view of the kamikaze aviators as being, you know, they are brave defenders of the homeland. And so the Japanese tend to focus on images of um, stoicism and mirth, um, even in the face of certain death. Here are pilots, you know, receiving their final toast before they go out on their missions. The Japanese focus on uh, the connection between the civilian and the warrior. So here we have Japanese uh, schoolgirls uh, waving goodbye to a pilot who's taking off from the Chiron Air Base in Kyushu, going off to his final sortie. They focus on the youth of the kamikaze pilots. So Ensign Yukio Araki here holding the puppy is 17 years old and will die the following day um, in a sortie off of, off of Okinawa. And another, another aspect that gets brought up uh, regarding these pilots, much like the World War I poets, um, this particular generation, there were a lot of very promising students and young academics. These were all college kids in a lot of cases. And so you have guys who, who had promising futures ahead of them that were just you know, snuffed out um, as a result of this program. On the American side, of course, the images are completely different. Uh, and obviously, we didn't have a chance to get to know these gentlemen on a personal basis whatsoever. And so the images that we have are, of course, very impersonal. Uh, what we see is sort of a relentless uh, fanaticism as planes bore in against our ships. Um, we see images of futility as uh, their planes are blown out of the sky by uh, our lethal anti-aircraft fire. And of course we see images of destruction. Um, the elevator of the Enterprise being catapulted 400 feet in the air as the result of a hit. Uh, this is an LST, and this is the Bunker Hill. And the natural outcome of that, of course, is the, the pictures of American dead on the Bunker Hill and shipmates uh, waiting to bury their dead on the Intrepid. The, the bottom line for me um, is that the whole kamikaze paradigm really brings into conflict two extremely different cultures. We have an American culture, and, and a, I should step back and say it's always dangerous to paint these sort of broad brush strokes over an entire culture. I mean, these cultures are obviously composed of individuals who may not conform to those cultural norms, but nevertheless, um, there are some general themes that I think we can pick out. And so we see in, in Japan um, very much, I don't want to say conformity, but an acknowledgement that the group is important, whereas in American culture, the individual has always sort of taken precedence. We have uh, a culture in Japan that celebrates ge gentlemen like uh, Kusunoki and the nobility of failure, whereas in America, we have this sort of, you know, failure is not an option mentality duty versus practicality, honor versus pragmatism. These are just two very, very different societies. And even for a person like myself who's been studying the Japanese Navy for the better part of 40 years at this point, I will admit that I still come into occasions where I'm just like, what is going on here? How can these guys think this way? It just, you know, tilt. It just doesn't quite work out. And that's a result of the fact that um, we have two very, very different societies, which makes their society very fascinating, I think, to, to people in the West. And I'm sure that that's uh, one of the reasons that the kamikaze phenomenon will continue being studied for uh, as long as World War II is studied. Thank you very much for your time. I, I want to ask the first question. If you, first if you question. remember, uh, Last month, uh, Sharon Lacey and, and our veteran uh, Quentin talked about the bonsai attacks. 
Uh, so a lot of what you've done has been uh, naval and aviation, but it, but that mentality also reached into the army. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that again, if we if we look at the sort of the the samurai ethos that permeates all branches of their service, uh, and you see it, I would say, much more in the army. You know, when I was down in Texas. Um, Craig Simons, who, who you probably know is just a fine, fine naval historian, um, he asked the question from the audience, what, what do you think would have happened, John, if the Japanese had actually started out in 1942 with these tactics? And I just thought that was an absolutely, f I'm not a big counterfactual history guy, I don't really like this stuff, but I, that's a really interesting question because, you know, if we postulate that kamikaze attacks were tactically, you know, five or six X more effective, and they had started off, you know, in 1942, could they, could they have wiped our carrier force off the map during that year? I don't know. Um, I, I think by the time we get to, to 1944, they weren't going to affect the outcome, but they might have in 42. It's hard to say. But the other thing that happened with the war in Europe ending, a lot of the uh, assets that were fighting the uh, Nazis and the Germans moved into the Pacific, yeah. so we got a reinforcement on that. Yeah. Uh, we have some questions in the audience. I had heard in the past that um, uh, some of these planes were rigged so that once they took off, they weren't coming back whether they wanted to or not. Generally, the scholarship says that that was not the case, that um, most of them carried full loads of fuel, for instance, um, because a lot of the times these guys went out and they couldn't find anything. You don't want to just throw the plane away at that point. So it, it, it happened that their aviators would come back from these sorties. If they came back too many times, you know, questions started being asked, obviously. Um, you know, are you really on board with this? Um, but the other reason to put enough fuel in the plane, too, is, of course, you want to, you know, increase the, the conflagration once you actually hit the target. I'm trying to think. I think that there were some of their aircraft. In fact, I'm pretty sure that there was one of them uh, that was purpose-built as a kamikaze aircraft towards the end of the war where the undercarriage actually fell off as you took the plane off. So that, you know, that's going to make landing kind of hairy. But uh, in general, I am not aware of any sort of systematic rendering of, of these aircraft on, on air where they are uncomable backable again. Well, with the, uh, the uh, deprivation of materials to build aircraft, I had heard it, they started substituting uh, bamboo and things. Did, did they end up with a, an inferior aircraft? Oh, yeah. And, and actually, in many cases, inferior aircraft were superior uh, for these purposes. One of the things that the Americans became very painfully aware of, um, there was an attack during the Okinawa campaign where the Japanese actually flew a couple of their training planes out. And these were wooden aircraft. Well, guess what? We couldn't pick them up very well on radar, and the VT fuse wouldn't work against them. And so um, I've actually seen the report where the Americans are like, uh, we know that they have thousands of these things in Japan. These would make beautiful weapons for immolating troop ships with. So, yeah, they, they were going to use everything that they had. And, of course, the other thing with troop ships, they didn't have a great deal of armor. They were just kind of a uh, liberty ship uh, uh, That's right, and we, we, were, we were putting uh, anti-aircraft weapons on our troop ships absolutely as fast as we could, but again, if you think about the threat environment that we're going to be operating in during an invasion, those troop ships are going to be relatively close in shore. The Japanese have got zillions of airfields out there, um, and so you know they can take that plane off, fly it close to the ground, go over the hills, and then just pop out over the beach, and lo and behold, there's that troop ship, you know, two, three miles out to sea. I've only got to survive those two or three miles to get that hit. That's, that's not that hard to do. Sir. John, are you in a position to comment on what the current attitude in Japan is with regard to those kamikaze pilots? As I say, I, th I think the current attitude um, is very much one that is sympathetic to the plight of those young men. Uh, it, it all depends on how, how, how recent you, recently you want to call current. Um, Hiroshima is very close to Kure, 
which was one of their big naval shipbuilding centers, and it's also the site of Etajima, which is their naval academy. They have a very large naval museum there. And one portion of that naval museum is given over to a very extensive exhibit on the kamikazes. My Japanese guide, as we were going through that exhibit, was pointing out all the poetry and so forth and so on. And you could definitely tell from him, and also from the tenor of the exhibits, uh, that it was a very sympathetic portrayal of these guys, you know, the, the, uh, the, the sort of tragic warrior um, mentality, if you will. You know, this is a sad tale, but these guys had to give their lives in the defense uh, of the country. There was a recent program on PBS about kamikazes, and toward the end they mentioned that the, uh, the Germans actually might have had some suicide squads that were, that were uh, for airplanes. Yeah, I, th I think I've heard that as well. And, and I think there were certainly some occasions when German pilots would, you know, ram, uh, ram American bombers and so forth. But there's a difference between, you know, isolated examples as opposed to a systematic program to sort of, you know, institutionalize this mode of warfare, which it very much was in Japan by the end of the war. Just as an addendum to what the Germans were trying to do. They had about a hundred or so volunteers, but Hitler, of all people, was opposed to the program. Mm. I did not know that. A number of years ago, uh, when I was doing some diving uh, uh, in Japan, I had a chance to uh, talk with some of the uh, uh, school instructors, and I could not believe the, the pile of bunk that they were teaching their students about the World War II, it was just lie after lie after lie. Have you ever heard any about this? <laughs> yeah, so the question is, uh, do the Japanese do a good job of educating their children about World War II? And uh, the answer there is a, ca <laughs> it's a, a category, well, it's unreserved no. Um, when my wife and I lived in Hiroshima, we visited uh, the Peace Park on two separate occasions and went to the Peace Museum on the atomic bombings twice. The first time that we walked into that building, within about five minutes, we were both sort of scratching our heads because um, the general vibe that was given off at the exhibits was very much on August 6th, 1945, the peaceful city of Hiroshima was suddenly attacked. And you're just like, you know, we need some context here. There was a reason that Hiroshima was attacked. Um, no, the Japanese are terrible at that. But one of the reasons that the Japanese are terrible at that is because we allowed them to be that way. Understand that when the Americans came in and occupied Japan after the war, we were in absolute control over the outcome there in terms of education and also the trial of war criminals. And yet, because of the very rapid evolution of the communist threat in Asia, it was convenient for people like MacArthur to shovel a lot of that stuff under the rug in order to create a staunchly anti-communist bastion in Japan. So, you know, from my perspective, Hirohito was a war criminal and should have been hung. You know, we had a perfectly serviceable crown prince that we could have put on the throne. But, you know, MacArthur was calling the shots over there, and he didn't want that to happen. So given the ability to shovel that stuff under the rug, the Japanese, I, I think understandably, have said, well, we're just going to continue shoveling. In fact, when, again, when we were there in the 1990s, uh, there was a very popular movie that came out that portrayed a love story between a Japanese soldier in China and a Chinese woman. And they interviewed some of the moviegoers as they were coming out of the theater in Tokyo. And one of the comments from uh, a young lady, and again, this is you know early 1990s, she was like, oh, it was a wonderful story. But why was there a Japanese soldier in China? So <laughs> again, there's a tremendous lack of context there. I've always heard that the word kamikaze comes from uh, saying divine wind. It had something to do with the some uh, not a hurricane, but typhoon it's sinking typhoon. the yeah. Chinese come and attack Japan during some war years ago. Can you talk about that shortly? I can't remember the exact year, but yeah, that's, that's exactly what happened. There were actually two different Mongolian invasions that were going to try to come in and, and invade Japan. And in both cases, there were very violent uh, storms that ended up wrecking uh, the majority of the invasion fleet uh, sufficiently that the indigenous troops could end up defeating the Mongolian invasion. So you were saying that towards the end of the war they were going 
almost full kamikaze um, suicide, certain hit, certain um, death tactics. If they had come up with another strategy, um, anything other than solely kamikaze, do you think they would have implemented that into the war? Um, in terms of Japanese options at the end of the war, strategically, they just really didn't have any. Um, when I look at World War II in general, I, I come back to a, a fundamentally an economic analysis of the war. And if you look at the disparity of the economic forces in action in the Pacific conflict, the U.S. starts off World War II with an economy that's five times larger than Japan's and is going to end that war with an economy that's more than seven times larger. We have twice the population we produce, you know, pick your raw material index that you'd like to talk about, coal, aluminum, steel, you know, blah, 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 oil. Um, we just, we're just going to crush them. And so given that overall context, I don't think there's anything they can do. Um, and you know, they were certainly putting their thinking caps on at the end of the war trying to figure out, well, how do we get ourselves out of this mess? And kamikaze tactics were the best that they could come up with. I certainly can't think of anything more effective. So, sometimes John, we, we did a program doing. about uh, seven or eight years ago with a guy from the, uh, I can't remember his name now. He wrote a book called A War They Were Always Going to Lose. Mm -hmm. He's a professor at the Air War College at Maxwell. And he, he uh, confirms with statistics exactly the point you're making. Quite interesting to hear you talk about the cultural and the historic influence that led to this kamikaze culture and that it was a kind of an accepted way to go. I'd like to hear your opinion on the similar kind of cultures that now we exist in the Middle East, where we in fact are dealing with car bombs and suicide bombs. Have we learned anything from the Japanese experience during World War II with these kinds of initiatives that might be applicable today? Um, I, and I got asked exactly the same question uh, down in Texas. What we have here is sort of the first mass manifestation of what we would refer to as asymmetric warfare. The reason the Japanese were using these tactics is because their conventional tactics, tactics had been rendered bankrupt. They couldn't do anything. So you're in a situation where as the weaker, impotent power, you have no mechanism left to do anything except by expending the lives of your people. I don't know that we actually have learned anything that would... Um, you know, what was the solution to, to uh, the kamikaze threat? It was to upgun your warships and try to put as many five inch and three inch guns on those vessels as you could as rapidly as possible. But there really wasn't, there was no solution to the mindset. Um, I guess one could make the cynical argument that the solution to that mindset was to drop an atomic bomb, but that is not a solution that I advocate for the Middle East. So. I, I, I don't know that there are actually any parables that we, can, uh, that we can carry forward from World War II that are all that applicable. What we're seeing in the Middle East, again, nobody wants to fight the U.S. Army on the ground. Everybody knows what happens when you do that. You lose, right? So the only thing you've got left to do is drive car bombs around and, and send a steady trickle of body bags back and hope that you get us to say, yeah, screw it, it's, it's not worth it. Is there a... Uh possibility that the Japanese people were hijacked by the Japanese militarists starting in 1905 and that they um, instilled a cult, they, they hijacked the society which was uh, Buddhist and uh, traditional and uh, uh, Confucian and uh, imposed this state Shinto fascism on them and that is something and then of course had a monopoly of information of communication during this time period, and then the, the Depression came. And so instead of talking about Japanese culture generally, we can say that this is something that was somewhat of an anomaly, and it helps us to understand better the Japanese today. And what I'm saying is that it's possible that the special, force, the special forces sensibility was more like today's ISIS uh, or the Al-Qaeda as, as a part of the Muslim culture. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I mean, um, we can, we, yeah, I'm, I'm painting again with broad brush strokes. Um, you have a, a Japanese culture that has, that has some of those cultural tendencies, but of course it's warped by 
um, the militarists that have risen to power and have, you know, very carefully nipped off any buds of democracy during the 1920s and the 1930s. So on, on the one hand, yes, you can look at the militarists as being sort of a, a blip or an aberration. It's certainly some, uh, but, but at the same time, they did use existing tenets of that society, you know, the willingness to make the ultimate sacrifice, if you will. It's sort of a lethal, a lethal. Right, right. Well, listen, we're going to end it up here. Thank you so much You're for welcome. stepping in. We, we didn't <laughs> lose a beat with this guy. Again. <laughs> Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org. Production services provided by Barrows Productions.